Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Reels. I'm Chris Kelvin, and this is episode two, in which we take a look at a great noir classic that not a lot of you know about. It stars Ray Moland and Charles Lawton. It's called The Big Clock from 1948. One of my very favorite kinds of film is the film noir. They've been making them since the 30s, and they make them today. But there are a lot of them, a lot of great ones that have fallen through the cracks and not a lot of people have seen. One of those is 1948's The Big Clock, starring Rima Land, Charles Lawton, and Maureen O'Sullivan. This one hour, 36 minute black and white Paramount release is a beautiful example of film noir mystery, but it's not film noir detective fiction. Here's the thing, that's what sets it apart from all of the others, because the protagonist is more like Hitchcock's everyman than he is like, let's say, Philip Marlowe or Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade. This is about a guy who gets caught up completely by accident. He's a married man, he has a responsible job and a child. This is not the kind of guy who gets mixed up in stuff. Now, our protagonist, George Stroud, played by Ray Land, works for Janeth Publications. Earl Janeth, played by Charles Lawton here, is his boss. He owns a giant publication empire. He has magazines like Airways, Styleways, Travelways, Artways, Newsways, and the one that we're concerned with here, the one that George is the editor of, Crimeways. George was just a small town guy in Virginia when Janeth picked him out of nowhere to run Crimeways magazine. George has a knack for getting to the heart of a crime. What he does is he takes all the irrelevant clues that the cops don't look at because they're just sort of like extra things laying around the periphery of the crime. He puts them all together onto what he calls the big board and he focuses on them and eventually he usually solves the crime before the cops, making him just the right guy to edit Crimeways magazine. Now, The Big Clock, like many noir classics, is told in flashback. I mean, look at Double Indemnity, look at Murder, My Sweet. The protagonists of these films begin to tell their story after the events have happened. So what you're getting is you're getting a recap, but you're seeing it as brand new information. And here we get a taste of that intro. Just 36 hours ago, I was down there. Crossing that lobby on my way to work, minding my own business, looking forward to my first vacation in years, 36 hours ago, I was a decent, respectable, law-abiding citizen with a wife and a kid and a big job. Just 36 hours ago by the big clock. And it's the most accurate and the most unique privately owned clock in the world. Now behind this huge map of the globe is a single master mechanism. Built at a cost of $600,000, it is set so you can tell the time anywhere on the earth. London, Chicago, Honolulu, and so forth. It also synchronizes the clocks in this building with those in the secondary printing plants in Kansas City and San Francisco, and in the 43 foreign bureaus of the Janet organization. Hey, mister, I'd like to ask you something. Yes, sir. What happens if the clock stops? Oh, Mr. Janet would never permit that. Good morning, Betty. Good morning, Mr. Stroud. And already you see that George kind of has a, a slight level of disdain, kind of biting the hand that feeds him for Earl Janeth, because, you know, Mr. Janeth wouldn't allow that. Mr. Janeth is a man of precision. He's obsessive, to the point, I would say, of obsessive-compulsive. He really, really is 
focused on time and expense, how time is money. His raison d'etre is the unstoppable march of time. As a matter of fact, in this clip from The Big Clock, you'll find out exactly what Janice is like. Mr. Janice is very upset. He's going to want ideas. Now, gentlemen, sit down. And I resent this. I resent this deeply. There are two billion eighty one million three hundred and seventy six thousand seconds in the average man's life. Each tick the clock beat of a heart. And yet you sit here useless to ticking your lives away because certain members of our conference are not on schedule. Where is George Stroud? We're always trying to find him. I do not propose to be held up, not even by Mr. Stroud. Have you uh, told the others what we want? Ideas to build circulation. Not just ideas, Steve. Dynamic angles. We live in a dynamic age, gentlemen, with dynamic competitors, radio, newspapers, newsreels. And we must anticipate trends before they are trends. We are, in effect, uh, clairvoyants, correct? Yes, yes, Mr. Janet. I have provided the tools. A budget of 37 million, a staff of 3,600, bureaus from Rajivik to Cairo, Moscow to Buenos Aires. All this is waste, sheer waste, under a leadership of chuckleheads. Now, Mr. Roberts, you have exactly one minute to tell us how you propose to add 100,000 subscriptions to Newsways. <clears throat> well, uh... So you see what I mean? Obsessive about time. Now, Janeth is like a lot of rich men. He's also obsessed about his pleasures, his needs, he wants the world to be focused on him so that he can give the world the things that he thinks it wants. And to that end, Janeth has had a series of mistresses. The current one, Pauline York, played by Rita Johnson, has come to the realization that time is running out for her. Janeth is starting to get a little tighter with the money. The, the sugar daddy train is coming to an end and she knows it. Now, she is around Janeth Publications quite a lot, so she understands the way things work there, and she knows how much Earl Janeth relies on George Stroud. Now, George is a married man. George loves his wife, but George also is very invested in his job. He has been married for six years at this point to his wife, Georgette, I know, cute, George and Georgette Stroud, I know. But his wife Georgette, played by Maureen O'Sullivan, is getting a little tired of the fact that he is so focused on work. They haven't had a honeymoon, they haven't had a vacation together. Something always comes up. When they get ready to go away, Janeth is like, I need you here, and George stays. And it's really putting a strain on their marriage. Well, Pauline meets George at a hotel bar where George is waiting for his wife because he's planning to take her off finally on their honeymoon. Well, the wife comes in, finds them together, and now a suspicion has arisen. But really, the only thing that Pauline York wants to do is to get control of Earl Janeth back, and she wants George to help, so she's trying to draw George into her plot. In so doing, completely screws up George's marriage and puts suspicion in the mind of Earl Janeth. Here, Janeth and Pauline meet at Pauline's apartment. Charming boy. What does he do? Nothing much, I'm afraid. Sort of a playboy. Where did you get this? Some crazy bar he goes to. At least this time he wears a clean shirt. Just what do you mean by that? You know what I mean. Are you bringing that up again? Throwing that cab driver in my face? You never forget him. Do you? No, do you? No, you cheap imitation of polio. And you don't forget the bellboy or the lifeguard last summer or the touted Saratoga and who knows how many others. You don't forget any of them, do you? Including the one to come. You talk. You of all people, you talk about my friends. Ha! Huh, that's priceless. What about you and the artway secretary? What about? You that? think I don't know in the stenographer, the elevator girl, the kid in publicity, the photographer's model? You think they'd look at you twice if you weren't the great Mr. Janna? You think you could make any woman happy? If you lived this long without knowing that everybody laughs at you behind your back, you'd be pathetic if you weren't so disgusting. You flammy, flammy, ludicrous... No!
Surprise, huh? And did you notice there's clocks everywhere so far in this film? Time is the undercurrent of this entire film. Now, I showed you the murder. Why? Because that's not the pivotal moment in the film. There's more, much more to this film. It's very intricate, very deep, and all the threads come together towards the end. It's really well written. Now, the original novel is by a gentleman named Kenneth Fearing. Now, Kenneth Fearing was a poet, but to make money, he had to work for Time Magazine. Now, Time Magazine was run by a gentleman by the name of Henry Luce, who was more than a bit dictatorial, super rich, and got everything his own way. They had a very contentious relationship. So when Fearing left Time, he decided he was going to write a sort of expose of what Henry Luce was actually like, and this is it, the big clock. Here's the funny thing, though. Time Magazine, in reviewing Fearing's book, and this film, both loved them. <laughs> so as I said, the murder is not the pivotal moment. What you really get out of that scene is watching Janeth crack, watching his control fall away, and watching this very staid and controlled man lose his shit and murder his girlfriend. Did you see, when they gave the close-up of Charles Lawton, you could see his concentration break. You could see the twitch in his cheek. He totally blacked out and lost his entire mind. He kills Pauline and then immediately tries to backtrack off it. He gets in a cab and he goes to the home of his second-in-command, Stephen Hagen, played by George McCready. Now, Hagen... He really wants to be the power behind Janeth Publications, and in so doing has done everything he can to ingratiate himself with the big man. Here, he actually decides that he's going to help Janeth cover up this murder. So he goes to Pauline's apartment and disposes of all of the evidence. And then he and Janeth are left with the big question, where do we direct the attention to? Who do we pin this on? Now, George Stroud has stood his ground. He wants to go on his honeymoon with his wife. He wants to have a honeymoon. He wants to have a life. So he finally puts his foot down to Janeth and says, nope, I'm leaving. And if you don't like it, I quit. So in revenge, Hagen and Janeth cook it all to fit on George. And now George is on the run. Now, neither Hagen nor Janeth know that George was actually involved. They think it was another man who was visiting Pauline at her apartment. So now they've set George to find this man. Use your criminal skills, your criminality skills, and find this murderer for us. So George now has to protect himself while not seeming to incriminate himself and not seem to be all nervous and just have to try and get through things. So here we see Janeth relaxing like most rich men do and plotting the ultimate demise of someone else while George is trying to control the situation, do damage control and direct people in a seemingly normal way to go very far afield of where he needs them to be. You know what's in this old bottle, Bill? Here's it up. Well, I'm tired and run down. I need a vacation. I should take an ocean voyage. Have you ever been abroad, Bill? It's stimulating. Different people, different customs. Do you know that in some countries, uh, after a murderer confesses, the police let him run and shoot him in the back? Do you think this uh, killer, is Jefferson Randolph, could be persuaded to run when we find him? His confession could just as well be prepared afterwards and then submitted to the police. Justice will be served. Wonderful story for crime wise. Randolph. Jefferson Randolph. This is really a tough one. It feels as if we're heading into a blank wall. Well, we've worked with flats before. Well, maybe. Let's check the assignments. Lily, you and Morton take the DeWitt Hotel. The DeWitt? The don't set, George. The Van Barth. Oh. Well, was it a Van Barth? Well, anyway, you're a society couple out for an early afternoon bracer. You get it? That will be a pleasure. We'll shoot you additional information as we get it. Uh, Edwin. Yes? You take Bert's place. 
Uh, don't you think you ought to uh, pick someone more suitable? Why? Edwin's smart. Besides, I never spot him for an investigator. Tony, uh, you and Bert the inquiring reporters. That means you have to check the doormen, newsboys, taxi cab drivers, anybody else you might have seen them between the Van Bath and Bert's place. Isn't that a big hunk of territory? Well, we'll send somebody out to help you. And that, you and Morgan and Talbot, you the research division. Now, this guy's name, as I say, may be Jefferson Randolph. He's supposed to come from a wealthy family. So you'll have to check the telephone books, tax records, utility lists, general business directory, or anything else you can think of in cities within two or three hundred miles. Now, any questions? Yeah. Can we ask about the blonde, too? <laughs> yes, you can ask about the blonde. But don't forget, it's the man we want and only the man. Now, suppose you climb on your horses, huh? And don't forget to report in as soon as you get anything. Or I'll be on the telephones. George, you uh, didn't give me an assignment. Well, you help with the phones. Get a couple extra installed. Check. Oh, Miss Adams. Yes, sir. I don't want to be disturbed. So Janet sets his henchman, Bill Womack, played by Harry Morgan of Dragnet and MASH fame, on to follow the course of the case. So you see him at the end of that clip walk into the Crimeway's office, and now he's going to follow all the clues that George is providing to find the killer and get him before the cops do or anyone else does. Now, one of the interesting things about Bill Womack's character doesn't have a line of dialogue in the entire film. It's all done through the eyes and through body movement and expression. Harry Morgan was a good, really good character actor and did this with aplomb and total style. Here, towards the climax of the film, you see a confrontation between Bill and George inside the big clock. Now, George being inside the clock is a metaphor for time. The time that Janeth has control of that surrounds him and the time that's running out for him. It's, it's a beautifully tied together piece of filmmaking. Now, I won't let you know about the ultimate outcome, but I will hip you to a couple of things that happened during the course of the film, like the inclusion of Elsa Lancaster, Charles Lawton's wife, as the comedy relief, Louise Patterson. Just so well done, and every time this woman is on screen, she is commanding your attention, commanding your interest. She just has this odd draw towards her, and it just, it works out really well. And there is a thread that runs through that sequence that is extremely funny at the very end of the picture. Also, I wanna give a really big shout out to Dan Tobin, who played Ray Cordette. George's assistant editor. 
What a great character actor this guy was, and just an enjoyable performance that just really screams second banana. It was just uh, it's a joy to behold. And for those of you out there who enjoy the little esoteric things that you find in old movies, you notice this young lady here, the elevator operator? What's the matter? I got poison ivy? We are not allowed to speak to people in the elevators. Mr. Janeth doesn't permit it. <laughs> That's right, it's Noel Neal, Lois Lane from the George Reeves Superman TV show from back in the 50s. Everybody's got to start somewhere. Now this film has been remade as a Kevin Costner picture. It's No Way Out featuring Kevin Costner, Gene Hackman, and Sean Young from back in 1987. That movie has not got a stripe on this one. Yeah, it's in color, and yeah, it's more modern, and yeah, it's got people who you might know in it. But no, it is by no means anywhere near as good as the big clock is. Well, that's it for this edition of Raiders of the Lost Reels. The Big Clock, excellent film, highly recommended. Go out, find it, see it, enjoy it, and then tell your friends. If there are films that you know about that people may not know about very much, you can comment them to me. I will check them out if I haven't seen them already, which I probably have, and I will let people know on this show because we have to get the word out about movies that are fantastic but underloved. Now, I really would appreciate it if you like and subscribe because that helps me out greatly and it helps me continue to bring these shows to you. If you do have a comment, please do leave it because I read them all and I respond to them all, each and every one. I thank you very much for tuning in. Next time on Raiders of the Lost Reels, another lost classic that I will hip you to and you will totally love. All right, I've been Chris Kelvin. See you next time.